Good morning. My name is Ricardo Costa. I am a field crops educator based here in Southwest Michigan. And today we're going to have Mike and Jeff talking to us a little bit about, well, Mike's going to talk about something that we actually didn't want to hear. That's about recommendations for late plant soybeans. But, you know, we're going to have to deal with that. We're going to have a link where for like a survey. So we would love if you could take the time, if you're like on, on, the, on the computer, at the, end of, uh, at the end of our meeting, if you can fill up that survey, it would be amazing. So we can try to do a better job next time. Mike, are you ready to give us a, your amazing talk about recommendations for late plant soybeans? I am, Ricardo. Uh, it's like Ricardo said, uh, I wished I didn't have to give you this talk. I wish we were all done. Um, but by the same token, we are where we're at, and uh, there are some management practices that do need to be adjusted at this time of the season. So let's get into that. First thing I'm going to talk about is yield losses with delayed planting. So before Manny Singh came to Michigan, we really didn't have much data in Michigan on delayed planting and soybean yields. So I asked my colleagues in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Ontario to share their data with me. And so this is what you see in front of you. We've got uh, four dates, June 1, uh, June 10th, June 20th, and then July 1st. And typically what goes through is um, we have yield losses anywhere from uh, 90% or I'm sorry, not yield losses. Yeah, yield losses anywhere from 10% as of a June 1st planting all the way down to 40% if we're planting down on July 1st. So what we've done is we've taken that data and a colleague of mine, Roger Betts, took that data and he converted it to this table that you see on the screen, those of you that are joining us uh, uh, by Zoom. And you will see that uh, he's taken it and, and extrapolated the data on a weekly basis, which has been very useful. So every seven days, you can see how the yields decline. So let's just, for example, look at uh, if you were to start with a 60 bushel yield um, here on the 7th of May, and then what would happen week by week to those yields. And as you see, they don't drop real fast until you get into June, and then they start to drop off, especially after the middle of June. Um, so by the time we're planting on maybe the 18th of June, which may be realistic for this year, uh, we're down to a 43 bushel yield. So that's what we're dealing with, and uh, you may have to make some decisions based on that. And again, that's the averages. Um, but the reason that happens is this slide right here is going to be kind of hard to describe for those of you that are joined by phone, but I'll do my best. Basically, Dr. Speck from University of Nebraska took two uh, photos, two different years, of four different planting dates, starting in late April or early May, all the way to mid-June and they were pretty evenly spread throughout that time. And what happens is when you plant timely or early, you get a really large crop canopy by the time we get our maximum uh, day length and, and maximum sunlight. And uh, so that's what we're really trying to do is develop a big factory before that happens. Well, as planting becomes delayed, uh, you'll see in the slide that uh, some of the plants are just barely even emerging. There's so much bare soil that there's not much of a factory there to capture the sunlight. Not only is it not capturing the sunlight, but it's not protecting the soil from evaporation. So any moisture lost from that soil is due to evaporation and not transpiration. And that's reducing yield potential. So that's the reason why delayed planting is really a, a real uh, detriment to us. But we can still uh, get some very good yields at this time of the year. So if we, if we follow some management practices. First thing I want to talk about is planting depth. Um, we really want to plant into a half inch of moist soil. That's really important. Most agronomists agree with that. It doesn't really matter how deep you go. Uh, well, if you go to extremes, you don't want to ever go any deeper than two and a half inches if you have to get into that moisture. But half inch into moist soil is what we're really shooting for. And at this time of the year, if you've got to plant into dry soil, but I don't think that's going to happen, but in some years late planting, we've got to plant into dry soil, uh, that may be better than planting into uh, marginal moisture conditions. This is probably one of the most important management practices that a producer needs to make, and one of the most common questions we get 
is do I need to change my maturities? Do I need to switch to an earlier maturing variety? And of course, it's, it's all relative. It kind of depends on what you're starting with. So the way I come from this is, come at this, is I use the word adapted. And I'll show you a graphic that comes up here in the next slide. And so everything is going to be based on adapted full season varieties. So if you're planting an adapted full season variety, as a matter of fact, let me just go to that slide first and then I'll come back to this one. Um, but here's the slide that I was referencing. So those lines that are going across, those ISO lines, would represent the maximum uh, length maturity group that would be considered adapted. And I know there's producers that plant longer beans than that. I, I know that. I'm aware of that. But those are not considered adapted. These would be the adapted uh, uh, ISO lines for maturity groups. So if you're in Ingham County, the full season bean in that area would be probably a 2.7 to a 2.8. And so if you're planting late, like the mid of, middle of, uh, of this month, like we're going to be, you probably should be planting at least a half a maturity group earlier than that. So probably a 2.2. And those of you that are more risk adverse might want to go to a full maturity group earlier than that. So you'd be planting a 1.8, something like that but at least a, a half a matur maturity group earlier than what's represented on this graph. Now, after the 15th, then you definitely want to go to probably more of a, uh, oh, I'm sorry, right there, to, to one full maturity group earlier um, after July 1st. But after the 15th, you want to go one half to one full maturity group earlier than what's represented on this graph. So, Mike, uh, just to interrupt you a little bit here, just to see, just, uh, just to make sure I got your idea. So, let's say in the in the best scenario, it's pretty sunny today, and the farmer is planting today or tomorrow. So that means he still can keep in that range. So let's say Southeast Michigan, where I live in Adrian, between two and a half and three. So if in the best case scenario, he's going to be able to plant maybe today, maybe tomorrow, he still can keep with what is on the graph. Am I right about that or, am, or I didn't that, understand? That is correct. It is correct, but it kind of depends on Jeff's forecast too because you know I think it's a cooler than normal uh, projection and soybeans in the vegetative stages and, and even reproductive stages do uh, advance based on, on heat units as well as photo period. So um, heat is important to driving them towards maturity, Ricardo. So it kind of depends on the future forecast. Okay. All right. So the next topic then was some, this is some data that excellent data that uh, Tom Seiler and Manny Singh put together. And what this is, is this is um, different maturity groups. Um, you can see a group one here in the light blue and then all the way up to a group 3.5 in the green at four different planting dates. And the one I really want to show you is the, the first set of bars and the last set of bars. First set of bars shows that if you're planting really early, you really push your maturities. There is a yield advantage to pushing your maturities a little bit longer when you're planting early. But now, when you look at these other sets of bars, they start to even out. Even in mid-May planting, uh, early June, there is no big difference there. And as you start to get to the end of the June, the late season beans, there's a trend for them to actually yield less. So there is uh, data to show that supports uh, switching maturities. Um, this is an interesting slide here. Um, it, uh, it shows the development. So what you have is you have the four different planting dates here that Manny and Tom put together, four different planting dates, and then you've got three different maturity groups within each one of those planting dates. And it shows how the season, it gets compressed as planting date gets, uh, uh, gets delayed. The part that's really scary about this is as you start to plant in, in very late June, it's really difficult to get the crops right. This is the date at which this crop reached R7. R7 is just one mature pod on, on the plants, uh, on 50% of the plants in the field, just one mature pod. So it is by, it's, it's safe from frost. R7 would be considered safe from frost, but it's certainly not harvestable. It's another 15 days anyways away from harvest. And look at how late those dates are. So file that away. Mike, uh, yes. I have another question. 
<laughs> I'm sorry yeah. to you one more time. But the thing is, so knocking the wood here, I don't want that to happen, but let's pretend I don't have enough time to harvest and we have frost damaged beans. What are your recommendations in that case? I know that we don't want that, ha that, that to happen, but we think we should be prepared as well. So what are your recommendations in that case? Well, there's a lot of things to consider there. It's a, it's a big question. And uh, um, first thing to remember is once they reach the R7 stage, frost won't reduce their yield. They are still keep, you do want to keep it. They are still harvestable if they get frosted in the R6 growth stage. The R6 growth stage is when you've got uh, uh, beans filling the pod on the upper four nodes on the stems. If you've got beans that are completely filling the pods on the upper four nodes in the stems, you, uh, you, you're going to be relatively safe. You'll, you'll lose probably a 10% yield loss, but they'll be keepable, they'll be harvestable. If that happens, though, what I typically have seen when they're that green, what I typically see is that first frost just takes the top of the plants off because it doesn't penetrate those green leaves very deeply into the canopy. So what happens is each successive frost damages a little bit deeper into the canopy. Is kind of what happens when they're frosted that green. So um, if you had to make one combine setup, the first thing you need to do is probably tighten up your concave clearance. That'd be the first thing to do. They're going to be tough to thresh. So try tightening the, the, the concave clearance. And then if that's not enough to thresh them, then you're going to have to increase the speed, the rotor or, or cylinder speed. But that's the first thing. But we do have a whole uh, litany of recommendations that are published on uh, MSUE News. So if you just Google uh, handling frost-damaged beans or harvesting frost-damaged beans, there is a, a current set of recommendations available there. Mm -hmm. Mike, this is... The, the yeah. This is Chris. There's a question in the chat box that might be right. related. It says, if you change to a shorter maturity, won't the soybeans be very short and hard to harvest? I just wanted to draw your attention to that. It's an excellent question. And actually, uh, Manny and, and Tom Seiler did address that in their work. They measured the lowest pod height, and they did show an inch difference um, and uh, that what they were looking at, not so much maturity, they were looking at planting rates. So there are some things that you can do. Um, you can increase your planting rate, and that will help to drive that lower pod uh, up. You, you, you do get shorter plants. Um, in, but one thing, I've heard that argument, but look at this slide that I have up there now. And one of the things that happens is this orange area is the vegetative growth area. And so if you plant a, a full season, bean, um, well, let's say, let's stay with just the group twos. So you got 39 days in the vegetative stages there. So that's why you get a bigger plant. If you plant a group three, you got 50 days. Um, but as you get planting about this time of year, when we'd be planting, it's not that big a difference. You, the vegetative stages really get compressed regardless of what maturity group you're planting. So I really don't think it's as big of an issue as what we used to think it is based on, on Manny's data and, and Tom's data. So um, they do get shorter as, as our planting date gets later, um, but uh, it's not as big a difference as what we think. As long as you're not going to the extremes, you're just going uh, half to one full maturity group earlier than that map that I showed you. If you go much earlier than that, you probably could get into trouble. Okay, I got to keep moving because I got the most important thing to talk about is right up here, uh, second most row spacing and planting rates. You definitely want to be in narrow rows, 15 inches or less. 30 inch rows are, are just really tough. Uh, they just don't canopy quickly enough. Uh, you're going to have a lot of more weed potential. Uh, it's just uh, a lot of more evaporation. It just don't close the rows. So 15 inches or less is better. You want to consider increasing your planting rates by 15 to 20 percent above the current MSU recommendations. So those current MSU recommendations are if you're in 30 inch rows, which we're not going to be doing at this time of year hopefully, but if you are, um, the current recommendation is 130,000. If you're in 15 inch rows, the current recommendation is 150,000. If you're in seven and a halves, it's 175,000. So you want to be at least at that at this time of year, and you may want to consider going 15 to 20% above those. But I wouldn't go any higher than that. That will give you plenty of seed out there. There's no sense uh, increasing your cost if you don't need to. This is a planting rate data, again, from, from Tom and Manny. 
Uh, I just want to focus on these last two because this is this is the time period we're in here is this early June, kind of a mid-June, and then this would be very late June. Um, but you can see that the 90,000, this orange bar, these are the 90,000 all the way up to 210,000. The 90,000 was not statistically different, dropping 90,000 seeds in 15-inch rows, than dropping 210,000. Uh, around uh, early June. Now that does change as you get into the end of June, but even 130,000, which is kind of lower than our current MSU recommendation, um, 130,000 was not statistically different than dropping 210. So you don't have to go crazy. You really don't. If you're in, uh, if you're going to increase your planting rates, certainly don't increase them any higher than 170,000 in. Uh, in 15 inch rows and maybe don't go above 190 to 200,000 in seven and a half inch rows. That would be the upper end. Do you need seed treatments with late planted beans? That's always a, a tough question. Inoculants, I think, uh, are, will have payback uh, most years, so I would keep that. Fungicides, if you've got some of the warm season, if you've had Phytophthora root rot in the past, then yes, you should probably keep a uh, a uh, fungicide that's effective against Phytophthora root rot. Um, insecticides, really the only insect at this time of the year I think that might be a problem would be the uh, seed corn maggot, and only if you're planting into fields that had uh, green plant material or manure incorporated within two weeks of planting. Nematicides have had really mixed results and uh, so I, I don't think the payback there would be with those. So I think really you could, you could eliminate some of your seed treatments at this time of the year unless you had Phytophthora root rot or a scenario that was set up for seed corn maggot. Um, aphids. When we plant late like this and we have an immature crop uh, late in the season, if we do get aphids blown across Lake Michigan from Wisconsin and Minnesota, and they, they will reproduce much more rapidly in vegetative stage beans than they do in reproductive stage beans. So just be aware of that. So scout your late planted fields often and thoroughly for soybean aphids. I know they've not been a problem, um, thank heavens, but uh, uh, they do like late planted beans. That's all I've got. I don't know if there's any questions, but uh, Appreciate the time. Mike, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Guys, what I'm going to do right now, just two things pretty quick. We are a little bit behind. There, there is, is a, a question in the oh, chat box. Oh, that's just true. Yeah, we have a, a, a thank you. Uh, there, uh, there is a question here that is asking at what population should you consider replant at this late date? A 100,000 is enough or should be replanted this late? That is a really good question. Um, Sean Conley, uh, agronomist from University of Wisconsin, came out with some really concrete recommendations about two weeks ago on his blog, and I would encourage you to search that. Um, but basically what Sean came out and said, uh, 50,000. Actually, 50,000 plants per acre at this time of the year. If you've got 50,000 plants per acre, there's very little probability of seeing an economic return to replanting. And, and the other thing that, that Sean is adamant about is the, the whole concept of tearing a soybean uh, stand out and replanting is gone. That is no longer a recommendation. Uh, what we would do is we would more like interplant and thicken the stand if we needed to do it. We would keep the existing stand and seed into it. Um, very, very rarely would we ever uh, recommend uh, completely tearing up and starting over. Um, and if you're more than 50,000 plants per acre, you don't replant. If you're less than 50,000, then, um, then you do need to consider coming into the field and, and maybe interplanting. But 100,000 plants per acre, that's a no-brainer. That's going to give you basically 100% of your yield potential. Awesome. Thanks so much. We do have another question here from Eric. He's asking at what is a good source for estimating crop growth advancement rate by GDD? Do you have no. an answer for that? <laughs> no, I don't. Um, there is a really good, uh, University of Nebraska has two tools. Irrigators have one of them. It's called Soy Water. Uh, it's a free software that's available from University of Nebraska. And then there's another one that's called Soy Sim. It's just a phenology model, but both of those programs do have a soybean phenology model in them. And that is really probably the best way to track 
soybean development because it's, it is a combination of heat and day length. And so um, the models take both of those into account. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time.